Hello. And Casey, whenever you're ready to start, you're welcome to start the presentation. Hello. Hi, just wanted to make sure everyone could hear me. Okay. Uh. Yes, I can see your desktop. Great. Casey, are you able to begin? Casey? Vivian, I don't. Oh, I don't think she's uh, uh, connected. I she she said, "Can everyone hear me?" Oh, Casey, oh. were you able to call in? Let me yes. check on that. Oh, you're here. Yes. So you could begin the presentation at any point that you'd like. Yep, I'm trying. You can't hear me. Oh, we could hear you now. Okay. <laughs> okay. Sorry about that. Excellent. Um, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for calling in today. It's great to have you on the line. Um, I'm just going to talk about some of the things we've been doing around developmental education redesign in Colorado. When we started this process, we really looked at developmental education pretty comprehensively. So if you happen to be interested in what your colleagues in math are doing, I can touch on that, but it's not really part of the plan today. I'm going to focus very much on reading in English. Um, and certainly, if you have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the chat function at any point, and Vivian will catch my attention and read them to me, just so that we, we keep you all engaged. So uh, what, what we've done in Colorado um, has been really to look at developmental education from assessment all the way through completion. So today I'll talk to you a little history of DevEd in Colorado and then walk through our recommendations, touch on math real briefly, and then really focus on college composition and reading, um, and then talk to you a bit about some of the administrative items that we've put into the work that we've done and really then our timeline around implementation and where we are right now with some of the work. So just like many of you are seeing at your colleges, our colleges in Colorado talked about some of what's been identified from CCRC, that the more levels of developmental education a student needs to go through, the less likely that student ever is to complete college English or math. Um, and we found that with our data to be completely true here and, and said, you know, there are structural things we can do to help address some of these problems, so let's. So in Colorado, um, we have developmental education. Students aren't a huge portion of our overall enrollment. We're looking at about 30%. About two-thirds of our students are not in developmental education. And in our state, we've got 13 colleges that are part of a unified system, then two colleges that are independent district colleges, um, and that's all of the community colleges in the state. So I'm definitely speaking about system colleges, and any of the data comes from the 13 schools, not from the two independents. From our system students, we've got most of our students who place into developmental education have math placements followed by a reading placement, by excuse me, by an English placement and then by a reading placement. So of the students who, who come into developmental education, um, our biggest proportion are certainly in math, but we serve a lot of students in other areas. And this is what's been traditionally going on in Colorado, that we have this course pipeline in math. There have been four courses eventually leading to a college-level math class, in English three courses, and in reading three courses. So students could test in at any point in the sequence. It's possible that they might need English 60 and reading and English 90 and then reading 90, or it's possible that they could need English 30 through and then also reading 30 all the way through. It depends on the student and where their placement scores are. And what we found is for years, we looked at course completion. Um, and this is really important in my mind because 
this really helps address the fact that our faculty are doing a good job. If you take any student at any point in the developmental sequence, on average, they have about a 63% chance of getting through a given class, and that's actually that's pretty good when you start looking at national data and course completion rates, that a 63% chance of getting through a class starts sounding fine. And so it in some ways begs the question, like, what's the problem? This is a three-year average. We can see that year after year, this is about what's going on in all of our dev classes. And so what we've found is the problem's not in any given classroom. It's a, it's a bigger structural problem. So the students who place two levels below a college course, there's these five exit points. So it's do they pass the first course? And then if they do, do they enroll in the next course? And then if they do enroll, do they pass the second course? And then do they enroll in the college level course? And then finally, do they pass the college level course? So if we have a student who's three levels down, they have seven different places where they can stop out of the sequence. And so this becomes a pretty easy math problem. And I, I know that some of my English and reading colleagues don't all love math problems, but here's how it works. As you take, if we know on average 63% of students can get through any given course in our sequence, we can say, do they pass the first course? Well, 63% will. And then do they enroll in the next course? And one of the things that we've seen in our own data is that of a given cohort of students who pass any given course, about 80% of them will enroll in the next course. Um, and so then when you look at the second course, it's the same, that about 63% of them are going to pass. And then of those, about 80% are going to enroll in the next course. And then again, 63% will probably pass that college level course, just looking at our three-year averages. So you can multiply those percents against each other. And at the end of just two courses behind college level, we find that only 16% of our original population is going to pay to make it through that college level course. Um, and students who are three levels below, you can add another 0.8 and another 0.63 to that particular equation and the number starts shrinking even more. So we know that for students who have a long time or a long time in the sequence, that it's not all about instruction, that there's some instructional things going on, but bigger than that, that we need to address some of the pipeline issues around how we structure courses and how we schedule students. Um, and so some, so this was all, this is all theoretical, the page that you're looking at right now, um, just using some of our averages. This is a, our actual data for students who completed that lowest level English course back in fall 2010. So it's to date. System-wide, we had 538 students who successfully completed that 30 class. So we started with 100% of the population. Then combined, do they enroll and complete in the next course? Now we're to 35. And so it's possible that maybe next semester one we'd pick up a couple more, but we're three years out on this. So it's, it's fairly unlikely that after three years we're going to pick up lots more numbers. Um, and then have they enrolled and completed in 90 or to 6%? And I didn't even bother pulling any college-level English classes because it's, we know it's smaller than 6%. So does anybody have questions to this point? Um, kind of why we started looking at developmental education and, and why the need to redesign it. I'm sure those are things going on certainly in your campuses too. Um, we have one question from Gail asking, does completion mean finishing the course or successful completion with the grade of C or B? What does completion mean? So clarification. That's a great question, Gail. For us, it means successful completion of the college level course with a C or better. And then if anyone wants to raise their hand or type something something into the chat for a question, I'm happy to take care of that. Well, please, like Gail, type in questions as you have them, because I promise to stop and make sure we get them answered. So what we did as a system is we decided to create a task force of so faculty, staff, student services folks to really talk about what is it that we could do? What's even going on on the national scale? Um, what's possible around developmental education reform? And so every college, um, our 13 who are in the system that end the two independents outside of the system, every college president was asked for faculty and then um, they had a list of 
identified other people who were important around developmental education. So student services, administrators, testing, advising, people who serve students um, with some really specific needs in these areas. So everybody sent us faculty, and then each campus got to pick one other person. And so it meant that we ended up with two people from testing. It meant we ended up with three advisors. We ended up with two vice presidents. And so between all of the campuses, we were able to cover kind of those other functions. Um, and most of the group was really made up of English reading and math faculty. And then the whole group was charged with creating policy for the system um, to look at what are barriers that we have? What are things that are going on systemically that make it really challenging to do things like register students for a co-requisite experience? And why are we having trouble with that? Knowing that if we made some policy around it, that it would make it easier for all of our campuses to be able to implement some of the things that we know are successful. So the overall goal of what we came up with was to move students quickly and effectively through that first college level course. That we really want to get away from that metric of, well, 63% of the students in my English 60 class passed, that that's, that's useful, but not going to tell us the whole picture around student success. And so we want to move how we're talking about student success to look differently to that first college level course. So we looked at a number of national models. We pulled in um, people from each of these different institutions and from several other places to come in and talk to our group. And we had open meetings. So there were certainly meetings where faculty from different campuses were more interested. Um, we brought in folks from Washington State and looked at the IBEST model, where they integrate all the way down to adult basic education in with some select career and technical programs. Um, so we really looked at what would it take to be able to integrate English reading and math skills into a career and technical program. So essentially there would be no prerequisites for a student who wants to come in and earn a certificate so they can get out into the workforce. Um, we brought in a couple folks from Tennessee to talk about modularizing the curriculum, what, what in Math Emporium really looks like. We looked at Los Medinos Community College. Their whole, they're part of the California Acceleration Project and they've done work around shortening the developmental pipeline and also acceleration in math. So one of their faculty members came out and shared their data with us and where they are and what that's looked like. Um, the Community College of Baltimore County and Peter Adams, which many of you I'm sure are familiar with, came out and talked to us about the ALP program and how that's running and space needs and classroom needs and how many faculty do you need around being able to really teach ALP in a, a very scaled way because that all along was one of our challenges, that we've done a number of things throughout the system, but we found that you know, the Community College of Denver might be doing 20 sections that look like ALP, but they're running 200 sections of English. And so if they're going to run 200 sections, how, what would that look like? How do we do that? We brought in someone from, from Chabot College to talk about acceleration and engaging faculty really about diving into pedagogy and practice and what does that look like. The group from UT Austin came out and talked to us about the new Mathways project. And the provost from Austin P State University came and talked to us about mainstreaming. So that's in Tennessee. And what they've moved to is instead of having standalone developmental courses, what they do is essentially use a developmental education placement to identify students who have additional need they go directly into the college level course and then they have additional support structures. So that's the mainstreaming aspect of it. Um, and we, part of the whole model around how our, our task force really looked at these was that we'd read articles, we would bring in speakers, and then we would pull apart each model around, well, what would work for us and what, what would work for some of our colleges? We really, ha we ranged the full spectrum from very urban to very rural and big and small, and so trying to find um, what is it that we can put into policy for our colleges so that we all know that we're doing a redesign, what are the pieces that make the most sense from all of these models? So what we did was we pulled all of the parts from all of the different national projects and from some of the pilots that have been going on for a number of years in Colorado to make an overall set of recommendations. So we said we were going to reduce the amount of time the number of credits and the number of classes that students spend in developmental education. 
And for us, we recognize that this means that we needed a curricular redesign. And so for any of the new curriculum, we said it has to be reverse designed from that college level course. So starting with what is it that students need to know for success in that college class, and then working backwards to only incorporate those competencies into the developmental courses. Um, one of the things that we found when we looked at what we've had traditionally is that over the years, we've said, gosh, well, wouldn't it be nice if they knew this? Well, yeah, it would, but we don't have enough room in this class, so let's add another class. And to really pair that back to focus more on what is it that students need to know for success in that college class was one of our challenges. Um, and then to build in active learning experiences. While we love the, especially the Washington iBest programs, um, we found that for all of our colleges, those would be really challenging because they're expensive models um, and they're, they're not things that lend themselves really easily to our system, but one of the parts that we really liked about it were the active learning experiences and getting students really engaged in the material. And so instead of having anyone work a math problem, for example, and say, well, isn't it elegant? to really make connections back to what students are trying to learn and to explain, well, of course you need to know how to solve for X because if you're going to weld these two pieces of material together, you have to figure out how much, how much material you need. And so here's how, here's how solving for X would help you. Um, and that we recognize that this is really an ongoing process. <laughs> that we can't just say, okay, we redesigned some stuff around developmental education in 2013 and we're good, um, but we're working with colleges to say, okay, what is your individual program evaluation and how will you know that your students are successful um, and can we make comparisons from how you're doing versus maybe how one of your peer colleges is doing and then can you share curriculum if you see that someone's being that much more successful. So we Casey. specifically... Oh, sorry to interrupt. I figured uh, we'd take a few more questions because some came in sure. while you were chatting. Yeah. So the first one is from Bonita, and it's how many credits are each course? And I think it was referring back to the earlier slide of how many credits uh, those courses are that you were um, referring to. Yep, I'll, I'll get to those. Okay. Um, the second question was from Christy. It was how many levels below college level are offered? So it, um, traditionally, we've offered four levels below college in math, three levels in reading, and three levels in English. Okay, great. And then from Alexis, what's the difference between acceleration and mainstreaming? Mainstreaming places a student directly into a college level course with some additional supports, and acceleration um, may or may not do that. So mainstreaming is acceleration. Um, but acceleration isn't necessarily mainstreaming. You could accelerate students, let's say, who are three levels below a college course by combining the first two levels. And so it's an accelerated process in that now they're in a single semester instead of in a year, um, but they're still not yet into a college level course. Great, thank you. And I continue to invite everyone during the presentation, if you have questions, feel free to type it into the chat and I will convey them to Casey. Or we, you could also raise your hand and I'll unmute you when we take specific breaks, breaks to ask questions. Thank you. Thanks, okay, Vivian. Casey, please continue. You're welcome. So in um, English and reading, one of the biggest shifts that we've made is to say that at the developmental level, we really want to talk about the two disciplines as a unified discipline. Um, and to call that college composition in reading. Um, so around CCR, we're saying that there really needs to be an integration of developmental reading and developmental English content, that any course that we design should be one semester, but that there are lots of formats that colleges could offer that in. So it could be online, it could be hybrid, it could be face-to-face, -face, and I'll, I'll get into what some of those look like a little bit in a little bit here. That um, wherever appropriate, we really want to put students directly into that college course with supports, but in looking at our data and looking at national data, we found that there are some students who look like they'll be much more successful in those mainstreamed models, and so to identify um, how do we do that and what does that look like for us, but to put many more students directly into that college course with additional supports, um, and that after successful course completion, for a single course, that that means that students have met all of their developmental reading and English prerequisites. Um, and the reason for that is this, is this picture. 
that what we found with looking at our own data is that students have multiple placements. So if you start in this top left corner, about 3% of our students who need English or reading placements need both, the lowest level of English and the lowest level of reading. All the way down to that far right-hand bottom corner where you see the 34%, the English 121 is a test out of developmental English and no reading placement. So about a third of the students overall need no developmental education. And so this is of all of our students who place into DEB, they've got no placements anywhere. Um, and so what we found when we started looking at the model is that students kind of fall into clusters. And it's not that they really only just, it's not like they just need English 60 and English 90, but what they need is English 60 and English 90 and reading 60 and reading 90. And so all of a sudden we've scooped many more students into four semesters worth of coursework instead of two. And, and then when we started looking at the curriculum, we found that there was a fair amount of overlap between what's being taught in reading and what's being taught in English. And while some of the language was different, the content was very similar. Um, and then at, at one of our institutions at Community College of Aurora, they'd been running an integrated reading English department, and they had four years of really good data to support student placements in those experiences. So we were able to look at a number of different sources and say, yeah, this makes sense for what our population looks like. So this is what we developed. The CCR courses, and I'll start with this place where we call it soft landing. And soft landing is for, for students who came in at that traditional 30 placement um, from, from the pictures that you saw before. And soft landing is a non-credit experience where students can come in, um, do a variety of different experiences. It could be um, a class that's no credit, all the way to it could be independent learning. Um, one of the models that I found that one of our colleges is doing that seems, in my opinion, like it looks good, although we haven't started collecting data on wide scale yet, is that they've partnered with their GED and Adult Basic Education Center on campus. And so what they're offering essentially is um, unlimited access to tutoring and then computer-directed curriculum. So students have an actual curriculum to work through and then one-on-one -on -one support to get through that curriculum so that they can retest and come into a, a credit-bearing course. Um, and part of why this is non-credit is one of the things we found in our comprehensive review of developmental education is that the Federal Financial Aid Handbook says that content that isn't at least at the ninth grade level is not aid eligible. Most of our students who come in at the developmental level are using financial aid. And so we knew that we wanted to have some access. We knew that we wanted to have an experience that students could get in and and see the path clearly to how do you get to College English, for example, from here, but that this experience for students at this low level is not a financial aid eligible experience. If we want to be consistent with what the financial aid handbook says. So we had the additional challenge of figuring out how do we do that and lay on top of that that Colorado is the only state in the country that doesn't currently have state funding for adult basic education. We had some real challenges around this. So we created um, essentially this thing that we call soft landing. It's a non-credit experience for students. And then the score that you see here, this is RC is reading comprehension 0 to 39. We're an ACCUPLACER state. So all of our students who come in and need developmental education would have ACCUPLACER scores. Um, and or a sentence skills score of 0 to 49 would be kind of this low level placement for students. Um, and colleges can pick how they offer this. And so one of the things that I'm excited about in our data is that after we run a year with different colleges choosing different models around how they want to offer soft landing to students, it'll allow us to go back in and look at the data and say, is there a clear winner here? Um, we didn't say in our policy that there had to be a particular way of delivery because there were no clear winners in the literature and we just didn't have enough information to say, oh yes, we know that everyone should refer to adult basic education because we just don't know if that's the right thing. So this is allowing us to do some pretty intentional educational research around, okay, colleges, do what makes sense for your population and then we'll start looking at outcome measures to see if there's any college that's chosen a way where students are more successful than others, and then we can move everybody to doing the thing that makes it more successful. 
SIMA 9192 is a different way to offer soft landing. It's essentially, um, you know, you we talked a little bit about mainstreaming into to a college level course. This is mainstreaming into a dev course. So instead of saying you take this non-credit experience and then you retest, this is you come in. The 92 is our um, pretty comprehensive five credit college reading composition course. So the 91 plus 92 essentially puts a co-requisite lab experience with it. And the 91 or the lab is really designed for students with that lower placement score. And they um, are asked to come in to the lab so that they get some really intentional, intensive help around what's going on in 92. So it's additional support, additional structure for students who come in at that lower level. But the content that they're being asked to pass is all 92 level content. So there's some scaffolding that would go on in that lab course. And so offering soft landing or offering the 91 plus the 92 is a college level decision. And right now it looks like our smaller institutions are offering the lab and our larger institutions are doing the non-credit option. And that's for a variety of reasons. But we, we asked colleges really to make these decisions based on what's going to work for them. And then the 92 class is something everyone will have. It's a five credit. It's a standalone course. You can see the placement scores, so the ranges of students who, who would be in, to, in this kind of course. And it's designed to prepare students for those college level English and college level reading, writing intensive courses. And then our 93 and 94 are studio courses. And so they're both three credits, and they're co-requisite with English 121 or a discipline strands course. So we call them um, Studio 121 or Studio D. D is for discipline strands. And so there's a couple ways colleges could do this. The 121 co-requisites, if you think back to the ALP model, they're very much like that, where students come in, some of them are placed into the 121 class with regular 121 students, um, and then they also are offered this studio experience where they have a co-requisite that's all about support for that English 121. And then we also have the discipline strands option for students because lots of our reading teachers in particular talk to us about the need for this, that we see a real need for reading and writing in a discipline. And we've run a number of these really as learning communities for many years at three of our institutions. And what we found is that students really like them and our faculty find them incredibly rewarding professional development experiences. So what we do is we have um, an English or a reading faculty member teaching the studio component, and then students are in a learning community or co-requisitely enrolled in some discipline course. So at Community College of Aurora, for example, they would be in a psychology course. And then all of the reading and writing assignments in that 93 class are about supporting what's going on for reading and writing in psychology. So they really work on strategies for being a successful writer in psychology. So they would focus more on APA, for example, than anything else, because in psychology you need APA and not MLA. Um, they also look at reading in a discipline. So what are the skills that a psychologist use to read journals in their field? Those skills look different than the skills that you might use when you're reading, let's say, a biology text. And so it's really focused more on some of that discipline thought it's not an option that all of our colleges are going to choose to pick up, but it's certainly out there. So um, depending, again, on the population and what makes sense, that's, that's what we're doing with them. So both studio classes are three credit courses, and then you can see the Accuplacer score ranges of how students might place into those studio courses. So just for what we've created, do people have questions? Um, I've gotten some through the chat that I could share with you. Yeah. So Ray asks, uh, will you talk about the supports and how they're budgeted? Because he finds that they're expensive, um, and, and it's very expensive to do so when it's a, done at a large college. Yeah. Um, gosh, I, I only will briefly, Ray. And the reason is because it depends on our college. So one of the things when we get into administration, you'll see that um, colleges are required to do at least three different things that are, would qualify as kind of supports that you're talking about. But they get to pick from a list, and they get to pick based on what's realistic at their college. So I can name two institutions off the top of my head that are going to require advising, but I can name another one where that would just never happen because they would need to hire 60 more people to be able to have advisors with reasonable caseloads so that they could advise all of their students. 
And since they're not going to hire 60 more people, that's just not going to be one of the things that they pick. Um, so what we did instead of saying, gosh, we and we did, we really like some of the intensive advising models, but knowing that we couldn't require that for everybody because of cost and because of some of what you're talking about, instead we gave colleges a list and then they get to pick based on their institutions and what's realistic for them. Okay, the next question comes from Maria. She teaches at a four-year college, and she wanted to know if the developmental umbrella included second language learners. And for if us, yes, it does not. Oh, okay. Um, so then it's a no. It, <laughs> for us, it does not. And the reason is that some of our colleges don't even have ESL programs, and so some students would come in, and there's no ESL opportunities, and so by default they would be in the, the umbrella of developmental education. At some colleges, it's a completely separate track that there's a really well-integrated ESL program, and, and they have all of their own content and coursework. And so there isn't a, a system-wide how we're doing that, because not all of our colleges offer the same experiences. OK. Uh, Tara asks, what scores are represented on the slide? Uh, she asks if they're AccuPlacer scores specifically, or if there's something else. They are. They're all AccuPlacer scores. Reading comprehension and sentence skills are the two are the two score ranges. You just answered the next question, which was, what does SS stand for? <laughs> so, <laughs> now we know. Uh, and last, Alexander asked, is a lab delivered via software, faculty, peer tutoring, or something else? All of the above. It depends on the institution. And so in our policy, we didn't say it has to be software delivered, let's, for example. Um, it, but it could be, certainly, if that's what the college looks at and the faculty at that institution look at and say makes most sense for the students on their campus. Thank um, you, Katie. Then, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So the next section are administrative items. So, so I mentioned that kind of that's the content in terms of curriculum and where we're going with it. But administratively, we really started by looking at testing and placement, that for about 14 years now, Colorado's been using AccuPlacer to test students. Um, and so one of the things we found is that tests can be much more specific and much more tailored to our curriculum. And that our group said we really want a Colorado-specific assessment that uses strands that align with what we're actually teaching. Um, the tests that we've always used are kind of the, just the generic here's what you get when you buy the product. And one of the things we've learned is that testing companies can really tailor the initial assessment to build what we want. So we said, OK, we're going to do that. And we also found that we want uniform multiple measures built into the assessment. And so the reason uniform is important here is that AccuPlacer is not a standardized test like ACT or SAT. It's very, very specific to the institution that's running it and to the site that's running it. And because each of our colleges sets up their own sites, one of the things we found is that they set them up a little bit differently. We have one place that says, gosh, we collect information about high school GPA and we use that, and another place that doesn't even look at it. And so that means that some students at some institutions have the benefit of um, having their high school GPA included in their placement, and some students do not have that benefit. And then Beyond that, how the test is set up makes a big difference for how students get placed in developmental or not. So one of the first things we found in our data is in, in the math side that there's the arithmetic test and the elementary algebra test. And if students take the elementary algebra test before the arithmetic test, they're less likely to place into developmental education than if the test order is switched. And so we found that consistent test administration is really a big deal and that we wanted whatever it is that we're using statewide to be the same for all of our students. So a student at Denver could transfer down to Pikes Peak and that there would be no difference if they took the test at Pikes Peak or if they took it at Denver. We also found that all of our assessments, so whether you use Compass or AccuPlacer or something else, are supposed to be validated every three to five years, and it's just not something we'd ever done because we had no centralized person to be in charge of that. So Test validation isn't something that one campus can do by themselves if every campus in the state is using a test. So we said to accomplish all of this, we, we really want a system level person um, to, to manage some of the, what are the multiple measures? What are the strands? Make sure we are doing some consistent test administration.
administration. And then each site will still have a local administrator for the local control issues and certainly to support students and the test issues, but we found that we needed a little bit more support around testing and placement. Um, so we started by saying that we would do all of this with College Board and AccuPlacer, and they said for a year and a half, oh yeah, yep, we, we do this and we've seen. I mean, if you look at North Carolina, they're doing this, um, and there are certainly other states that have something that looks like this in place. And two days before our board meeting, where, where this all rolled out, College Board said, you know, our business model, it makes more sense to just focus on SAT and PSAT, so we're going to be less focused on AccuPlacer and we don't want to do that customization. So that put us in a position where we um, have decided to try to work with Pearson and see if they're someone who can do some test customization for us because they own GED. Um, and so now we're in that process to see if that makes sense for us. But um, this is certainly the direction we're, that we're moving. So around student support, and I think Ray asked a question about this earlier, but we're saying that colleges need to use the SESI best practices. So some of those include required orientation, goal setting and planning for students, no late registrations, a first year experience, a required student success course, tutoring, supplemental instruction, case management. So there's a number of, um, of items that are out there that have been validated in a number of different ways that say these are successful strategies for students. So what we created around student support was to say that colleges need to develop a plan um, that addresses planning, initiating, and sustaining student success for everyone in developmental education. So a college could say, for example, um, for all developmental education students, we're not going to allow late registration. So there are colleges that will look at that and say, yeah, that makes a lot of sense, we're going to do that. And there's colleges that would look at that and say, no way, when we look at our enrollment patterns, everyone registers late, so we're not going to do that. So that varies by campus, and so everyone has to pick three things, but the three things they pick are going to be different. And then this is another one of those areas that will really allow us to do some educational research so we can look at, are there differences? Because when you look at the literature right now, everything on this list seems to matter but there's nothing that you can look at and say, well, if everyone would just do tutoring, that's a clear winner. That, that's the one that helps all of our students the most. We know it helps, but we don't know that it helps any more than case management. Um, and so this has the potential to help us start to make some of those comparisons within our own system. And then in faculty support and development, we're asking colleges each to create their own professional development plans. And so the things that have been called for limited full-time positions. We have this status in our system where colleges can offer a position to somebody on a limited full-time basis. Um, and so the idea is that that helps us stabilize our workforce, especially because we have such a huge adjunct population. It makes training people for innovation that much more challenging. So the limited full-time allows us to bring people on on a full-time basis for a few years so that we really can innovate. Um, looking at release time for implementation and reassign time to develop and implement, especially the student success strategies. That campuses are, but have been asked to put together functional work groups, so to bring in their experts who do banner scheduling, advising, testing, so that everyone sees here's what the goals are on on the faculty side of the house. This is what we're trying to do with our curriculum. What is it that we need to align the rest of the campus to, so that we can schedule these in a way that really makes sense. And then to do continuing professional development that really focuses on research-based strategies. And lots of campuses are finally now to the place where they're starting to train transfer level and developmental faculty. So depending on how colleges are structured, we've got some that have an English department. And the English department teaches developmental reading and developmental English and college level English. And then we have other campuses that have an English department, a developmental English department, and a developmental reading department. And so it means that there's people in transfer level and developmental who get the same students, and we're trying to serve the same students. And if you think back to the model, the model certainly lends itself to these different areas working together, but not every campus is set up the same way. And so it means that the training needs vary. Um, and then we went out and said, here's, here's what success is. So successful developmental students should be measured in math through successful completion of any college-level math course. And 
So for us, our naming conventions are that college level are 100 or, or higher and that developmental are courses that are under 100. So 99, 1 through 99 would all be developmental courses. And then in English and reading, it's successful completion of any college level English course or any college level discipline strands course. So especially where colleges are going to start offering those 093, Studio 093 options. Um, it's possible that a student doesn't need English 121 for their program. And, and so if they're co-registering for a psychology program, a psychology course, and that reading and writing in the disciplines course, that passing that psychology course is the success there. It's not that they're trying to get through college-level English. And so making sure we align what our outcome measures are with what the student's goals are. Um, so before I move on to this, I want to take a couple of questions because the next thing we're going to talk about is some of our enrollment projections. I know it's maybe not your favorite, but it's certainly something your administrators would look for. And so I just want to give you a sense of maybe how to do that. So does anybody have any questions through what our administrative recommendations look like? Um, one question we have from Kay and Linda is, what do you mean by first year experience? Um, so generally, a first-year experience is run um, like a course. So we call ours Advancing Academic Achievement or AAA courses. And so it could be um, a week-long boot camp before semester starts, kind of like an extended orientation. Or it could be twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, your first-year experience class gets together and meets, and there's actual curriculum that's tied to that. Okay, and then uh, Ron had a question. Uh, he said, do you have data that confirms linking a composition class with a specific discipline course strand uh, that the linking improves outcomes? We do. Um, not from all of our campuses yet because not everybody's running it, but we, can, we have data from three different institutions that supports that. Okay, and then Alexander asks, uh, what were some examples of the most dynamic, unique, and successful out-of-class support networks that combated the external pressures slash problems that often impact developmental learners? Oh, gosh. <laughs> we have, Alexander, we have some incredible faculty, people who do, every time I hear a new story, it, it seems like the most outstanding dynamic example. Um, Gosh, I guess I would point to some of what's going on at Aurora, that um, if you have an opportunity to see that group present, they really talk a lot about different things that they've done on a one-on-one -on -one basis that in many ways feels to me more like faculty doing some case management than bringing in a case manager. And some of the connections that they're able to create with students really seem um, incredible. Great. Thank you, Casey. Yeah. So this Excel file that I have open right now, and I'm just going to go through it briefly so that nobody glazes over. But what you're looking at um, are this first block is current reading English system-wide. So we've got headcount, sections, and credits over a three-year time period. So we've pulled up average sections, headcount, and credits um, so that we can look at both duplicated and unduplicated. What's our enrollment look like system-wide? And then with the redesign, because we've essentially changed from six courses that are sequential that would theoretically lead to an English 121, um, we're moving to something that looks really different. And so as, as we do that, not just, hey, I'm going to pilot this with six sections, but as we do that with everybody, the question becomes, okay, well, do our sections change? Do we need to plan for more or, fe more or fewer Faculty, students, sections, what does this look like? Um, and so what we did was we said, okay, let's take these three-year averages. Let's look at how many students we have, how many sections we've had, and how many credits we've had traditionally, and put that into what this new experience looks like. And so this second block is the soft landing, completely non-credit, and it's built out here to assume that every student who would go into soft landing goes there. Um, as a class, that it's a complete, that it's a class where we built it out with 18 students in the class and that there's just no credit tied to it. Um, and then we went ahead and did the CCR 092 experience um, and then the studio courses and the English 121 courses. So we pulled essentially headcounts from above um, to figure out, okay, what could we project? So 
what we actually project even in year one is that we go here from um, 1,400 sections to here, again in year one, just by changing the model to 1,700 sections. So we can look at that and say, okay, well that means that they need more people to teach because there's more sections. And then here when we start looking at credits, we've got um, 78,000 credits, and then here in year one we're saying it's, we're looking at 100,000 credits. And so this was really important for us because there was kind of that initial reaction like, well, we're going from six classes to one or two, um, so that, uh, that just on face value doesn't sound like there could be a gain in sections or a gain in credits. But the difference is that up here we've got three credit, largely three credit experiences, and down here we've got students in all the studio experiences who are attempting six credits in a single semester. Um, and so that really changes what the model looks like. So this you can definitely play, for, play with on our website. Um, then down here we've got proposed if we did the integrated soft landing, so that co-requisite lab. Um, and if you look here, like I did all of the studio sections with nine students in a section as opposed to 18. Um, so there's just different ways that you can start modeling this, but we've got all of the kind of modeling rules built into the Excel, Excel spreadsheet. And um, it's all on this website that you have access to through this presentation. Um, and the idea is it's our developmental education website, and we want people to be able to go in and model and say, okay, well, that's the system, but my department is only, we're only running 60 sections, and obviously this is looking at 1,000 sections. And, and so what does it look like for 60 sections? And to be able to model that out, because as you start, um, as you start to get into, okay, who do I have to staff and what does this look like? Um, how many faculty do I need? This kind of modeling can really help you think about what your enrollment might be. Um, and then for anybody financial in the group, your expenses get tied to sections and your revenue gets tied to credit hours. So you can just shoot your CFO an email and say, what are your expenses, expenses per section and what's your revenue to credit hours? Um, and while that will only account for instructional expenses, you can account for instructional expenses now and in a redesign and to start being able to talk really concretely about the financial impact of what it is that you're proposing to do. So then our group has come up with, so we, we went ahead, we came up with the policy, we said here's where we're going, this is kind of our roadmap, and then um, what are our, how do we implement this? Because our goal has been to implement this for everybody. We've you know, we've spent six years doing pilots around developmental education and redesign, and our pilots have some great data, but faculty by themselves said over and over, we cannot scale this up on our campuses for a variety of reasons. And so it really took our board saying, okay, here's what the new policy is going to look like. So now everybody's engaged. It's gotten our presidents on board. It's gotten our deans on board and our VPs. So even at institutions where that wasn't always an easy thing. Now it's, okay, we all have to do this. And, and that's really changed what the perspective looks like. So we have this core implementation team. We have 12 faculty members, six in reading English and six in math, who have been really focused on curriculum and content, training and professional development. So every campus has two um, core implementation people, one from reading English and, and one from math who's assigned to their institution. So if um, Steve at one institution says, you know, I'm in reading English, but the person from my institution on the implementation team is really a math expert. He has a resource, somebody who he can call and say, how are you thinking about soft landing and how might we do that on my campus? And then overall at the system level, we have a redesign advisory group. So they're administrative folks, banner, business officer, advising, financial aid, um, a few of our experts from different institutions who we can call and say, um, okay, we know that we have this particular challenge in Banner. What's the best way to address that, both long-term and short-term? And so long-term, we know that it means working with the Lucian and getting a, a couple different things put in place for programming, but short-term, what is it that we need to do to be able to block co-requisite classes? Because we want to do this now. Um, and then testing still working with College Board, working with our testing center directors, and, and now working with Pearson around, 
can we develop something else that really meets our needs here? So our timeline is incredibly accelerated. This spring and summer, um, our, our discipline teams have been working together to create professional training, um, development, and we have all, some curriculum structures really put out there now. In this coming fall, uh, schools that have already been working on projects will ramp up whatever they've been doing, and several are picking up um, a few new things so that they're really getting ready based on where the models are going. And then spring 14, that's really our transition semester, so that would be the last time that campuses will continue to offer the 30, 60, 90, and possibly 99 from the old sequences. And then by next fall, fall 14, all of our colleges should be operating with the new models in place. So what other questions do you all have for me? Um, I've got a few more from the chat area. Uh, Christy asks, how did you measure the success rate of students enrolled in a developmental education reading course and the 100 level course such as psychology? Uh, was there a control group, a measure? Um, most of our comparisons for those uh, discipline reading and writing courses are about matched students, and so we take their, their twin. Um, it's not their actual twin, but we look at student twins, so we can pull out these are people who are both women, who both have similar test score profiles, who both have, we can match on a variety of demographic factors, and then we know that one of them is in this matched course and the other one took a traditional developmental course, and then um, the outcome measure we're interested in is passing that 100 level course. So then what we look at is how long does it take for people to get through intro to psych in that example, for example. Okay, um, another question comes from Tara, and you alluded to this because you mentioned you'd be having some professional development for faculty, uh, but she asked specifically what types of training are being done for faculty. So it varies by campus. Um, we did a workshop a couple weeks ago where faculty came in and just talked about the redesigns. It, and, and we really, we spent all day and we went into it saying, in reading in English, we're going to do all this curriculum development around these different classes. So people broke up in the groups, and we started working on it, and we found out that that's not what people wanted, that what they really needed was to talk through how they were going to do some of these things on their campuses, and that the curriculum they're, they get. They look at the new competencies. They think through, yes, we teach this in reading and in English. That's not, that's not so much the identified hard part. Um, but how does this work on a campus where there are certain populations? And so what they really needed was to spend some time talking to each other about, okay, what decisions are you making on your campus and why? Um, and then from that, the implementation team is planning some more targeted trainings that they're going to do regionally. Um, and so they'll be open to anybody, but they're really more regionally specific. And so, for example, we've got one institution that has said, um, we don't have an integrated right now reading in English faculty groups, and so what we really need is some, some training and some skills around, okay, you've taught English for several years. What are reading skills that you should be teaching to students in your class? And let's tease some of those out and be really specific about it. And for reading faculty, you've been teaching reading for years, and so what are some writing skills that you may, and both, what we're finding is you're probably already doing a lot of this in your classes, but you don't call it the same thing as the other discipline. And so it's really about bringing in somebody to facilitate what does that look like, what does it look like in the classroom. Um, and so, yeah, it, it really it depends. It depends on the campus and what folks are saying they need. Okay. Uh, Bonita asked uh, that she'd like to have access to your PowerPoints to share with her dean. And something I could share with everyone that may not have been on the call earlier was when we started, I indicated that we'd be recording uh, the presentation. So I'll be happy to send everyone a copy of that link once we have it posted. And Bonita, and I guess to everybody, if you check out our website, it's the cccs.edu forward slash DETF. Um, I know today they just set me up the URL, so it's forward slash DE for developmental education. Um, it'll take you to a site that's got everything you could want on it. We've been really intentional about keeping all of our work in one place, and so the whole work group really puts up things um, all the way down to one of the folks on the group wrote a white paper around what was our process and how did we put together the team, who was on it, 
um, kind of what were the preceding events to get us to this place, and so it, it's all there. So depending on what it is you're interested in or where you are in your process, you're welcome to anything we have. Great, and um, I'm going to, I guess, throw it out there again. If anyone wants to ask a question or ask me to unmute them, I'm happy to do so, so you could ask a question. As a matter of fact, since we're at the end, I'm going to start unmuting everyone, so just feel free to speak up once you see that you're no longer muted. And uh, we also want to take the opportunity to thank everybody for attending. So yeah, you'll you start hearing some ambient noise now because I'm unmuting everybody. <laughs> Well, thank you, everybody, so much for coming today. I really appreciate it. It's nice getting to talk to you. And please feel free to contact me if you have other questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. You're also welcome. Thanks, Vivian. You're welcome. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, you too. Talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Bye.